Hello and welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. Today we're talking about eternal security or OSAS, once saved, always saved. I get a lot of comments, I get a lot of emails about eternal security. Do I believe in eternal security? That sort of thing. And so today I figured I'd do a video and cover eternal security. Now what I want to make clear from the beginning is number one, I, I do support eternal security. I do believe in it. I do believe that once a person has come to faith in Christ, that they are sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. And we're going to go over some passages and cover why I believe that. That's what this video is about. But I also want to make clear that what we are not talking about, we are not talking about the P in TULIP. We are not talking about perseverance of the saints. Um, perseverance of the saints. The, the only thing that Calvinism has in common with the Bible believer regarding the tulip is that both the Bible and Calvinism teaches that once a person is in Christ they are secure in Christ however Calvinism believes a person is secure in Christ for completely different reasons than what we're going to cover today I do not believe in the P and tulip and I do not support it and I've got a guy in my church who says that uh, one time somebody confronted him are you a Calvinist or an Arminian and he's like, well, which one believes in eternal security? Well, the Calvinists do. Well, I guess I'm a Calvinist then. And some people think they're one, part, one point Calvinists because they believe in the security of the believer. Well, they, Calvinists believe in the security of the believer for completely different reasons than what we're going to cover today. Um, they believe in it because they're elect, but we're not, I'm not going to get into all of that. I'm going to do a separate video uh, coming soon to a city near you dealing with uh, why both Calvinism and Arminianism are both against Scripture, why they're both wrong, and how they get these things wrong. But we are going to have to talk about perseverance of the saints a little bit today just to differentiate on why that's not what we're talking about and how it is essentially very much like its Arminian counterpart when it comes to practicality. So we're dealing with eternal security called Once Saved, Always Saved. In, in many years, I've never heard somebody who actually believes it call it once saved, always saved. It seems like people who don't believe in eternal security call it OSAS or once saved, always saved. But uh, I, I don't care either way. We're going to call it what it is. Uh, the, the idea is uh, I believe that once a person is in Christ, they are secure. They can have confidence in Christ. You might want to call it eternal confidence. We have confidence in Christ. Um, we have eternal life. So I want to talk to you about how, how salvation works. And that's important to understand. When a person believes in Christ, the Holy Spirit seals them to the day of redemption after they believe, according to Ephesians 1.13. After they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of redemption, the Holy Spirit baptizes that person or immerses that person into Christ, into the body of Christ. You, once that happens, they are then bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh. They become part of Christ, and they stay that way until the day of redemption at the end of the church age. So let me cover some of these passages and show you why it says this. I got my laptop here with my notes in front of me, and so we're just going to go down this in order. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Notice that is after that you believed. Verse 14, that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So the redemption, the earnest, if you ever bought a house, you had to pay earnest money. What that is, it's a guarantee that you're going to come back and complete the deal. And the Holy Spirit is the earnest. It is the guarantee that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and complete the deal. Romans 8.23 talks about the redemption of the body. 1 Corinthians 15 says we shall all be changed. Your body is going to be changed. That is called the day of redemption. Well, after you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit seals you until the day of redemption. And we see this later in Ephesians 4.30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit, but you can't lose your salvation. You can't lose eternal life. It's not pending life. It's eternal life. It's not temporary life. It's eternal life. So you can't lose that. In 2 Corinthians 1.22, says, Who hath sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So you have the earnest, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and we find out that's till the day of redemption. 
There's a very thorough explanation of this in Romans, starting in verse 8, 23. It says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirits, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And then it goes on, and it winds up in, in, at the very end, the last two verses. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing can separate you from the love of God. So what happens after you trust Christ, after you believe Christ, the touchstone of the gospel is trust and receive. John 1.12, receive, and the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, talks about receive. That word receive shows up a couple times. You have to receive the gospel. You can't, uh, it's not just knowing that it's true. You must receive, you must trust and receive. After you trust and receive, the Holy Spirit that seals you does something. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, are we all baptized, or immersed, or dipped into, or plunged into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And that spirit, if you keep going, you get to verse 27 in the same chapter, and it says, Now are ye the body of Christ, and members in particular. The Holy Spirit baptizes us, immerses us, plunges us into Jesus Christ, into the body of Christ. And then Ephesians 5 says, We're bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh. It's just like we're part of him, because we are. We are part of him. In John chapter 10, uh, he says, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. And that's used for eternal security a lot of times, but it's actually even stronger than that. Uh, according to scripture, doctrinally, you're actually part of his hand. Not only does he have a hold of you, but that's just an illustration. You're actually part of his body. He doesn't even have to have a grip on you because you're in there. You're part of the body of Christ. Bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh. And in 2 Timothy 2.13, we find out that he cannot deny himself. Once you're part of him, he can't deny you because denying you would be denying him because then you, you are part of him. You are part of his body. You're part of the bride. Let's take a look at 1 Peter. So, so what I want to establish so far, right off the bat, that eternal security, your salvation, a lot of it takes place in the future. For example, your body. And this, this goes over with a lot more humor when you're standing in front of a live audience because obviously our bodies haven't been redeemed yet and you can just look at your body you've got health problems and ailments one day you're going to be redeemed if you're in christ and you're going to have a perfect body you're going to be uh, conformed to the image of jesus christ it's going to be wonderful that part of your salvation is future there are some other aspects of your salvation that are future and the holy spirit seals us puts us in christ and guarantees that those future aspects of our salvation will in fact come to pass so, so that's how that works. So you have to understand that the Holy Spirit is the mechanism of eternal security. And what the Holy Spirit does, that's very important because the ministry of the Holy Spirit changes right at the beginning of the church age and right at the end of the church age as well. And that means that before the church age and after the church age, the Holy Spirit is not doing exactly what he's doing right now. And that'll be very important as we move on. The Calvinists believe in eternal security because of election, not because of the mechanism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I'm saying about the Holy Spirit, they probably wouldn't deny that, but that's not their base reason. They do believe we're sealed by the Spirit till the day of redemption if you're elect. However, they have no way to tell if they're elect. They, uh, they, have, they don't believe Jesus Christ died for everybody, and they actually have no written promise that guarantees that Jesus Christ actually did die for them, that they're one of the ones that Jesus Christ died for. So um, being sealed by the Spirit, placed into Christ, the only way they can tell, uh, the, the only hope they have is whether or not they're elect. If they're elect, they get all that, but there's really no way for them to tell if they're elect except for the P, which we'll get to in a few minutes. We'll talk about that. The P and tulip, that is. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, now I can't cover, I'm trying to keep this video a little brief. Some of my videos, I, I try to cover all the opposition that the topic might encounter. But this one, I'm just going to throw some information out there 
And if you have any questions, email, write in, make some comments, and we'll do some follow-up videos if we have to. But I do want to just cover the basics of eternal security in this one here. So we're going to try to just move right through some of these things. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, well, I'll go back to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You should know regarding soteriology that Jesus Christ's death on the cross was part of your salvation. The fact that he rose from the dead has to do with everything that we have to look forward to. Some people make a big deal out of the it is finished part of Christ on the cross. But if it was, if, if it was finished in the way some people think it was finished, he would not have had to come back from the dead. When he says it's finished, the task that he had to complete of bearing the sins uh, physically in his body, that was finished. However, your glorification and his glorification had not taken place yet. And so that still, that still lies ahead. That takes the sin, nails the handwriting of the ordinance as it was against us, out of the way, making our glorification possible, which well, that kind of salvation only comes to those that believe. <clears throat> it says in 1 Peter, so by the resurrection of the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. You have an inheritance in heaven. Now we're going to talk about a different aspect of inheritance later. There is a reward type of inheritance where you rule and reign with Christ. And then there is an inheritance where I go to prepare a place for you where you have a definite place in heaven regardless of uh, whether you rule or reign or regardless of how much you rule and reign when you get there. So there is a, there is a guaranteed aspect to some of our inheritance in heaven. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. So it's reserved, it's waiting, verse 5, who are kept by good works? No, who are kept by the power of God. Not the power of Kevin, not the power of you, were kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We say, I thought I already was saved. Yeah, you can say you're saved, but the way we say we're saved it's really a, a promissory note. We take it on faith that we're saved. We are guaranteed by the Spirit that in the future the time comes. In the meantime, all we have is the witness of the Spirit uh, witnessing to us internally and matching up with the Word of God that we are saved. It's something we can completely rely on. We can say we have salvation. It is something that we possess, but in time, the realities of salvation are things that are going to happen in the future. So the Holy Spirit keeps us through the power of God to the future aspects, until the future aspects of our salvation, the redemption of the body, getting the inheritance, that sort of thing. Those things will come in the future, and the Holy Spirit locks us in. We're kept by the power of God to those things ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice. Now, for a season... If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, going through some trials and tribulations, that the trial of your faith, verse 7, being much more precious than, that, precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ to the believer. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I'll look at verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. The end of your faith. In other words, the, the end state, the consequence, the result. When the, when the day of redemption comes, when the rapture happens... Oh, the rapture is not in the Bible. Rapture is actually in the Latin Bible, rapturo. Uh, but that's the catching away of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When we're caught away, when we're changed, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we will receive, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So all the salvation right now, we're saved by faith. One day it's going to be a reality. Remember what 1 Corinthians 13 says? That we have faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these, the one that's going to remain, is charity because faith and hope are going to go away. Because why do you have to hope for something that you see? Why do you have to have faith in something that you see? 
faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. One day you're going to see your salvation, and it will no longer be by faith. It will just be a reality that just is. And then the charity will remain. So part of your as salvation, part of the aspect of your salvation is a future aspect. And so we've covered several things. The Holy Spirit, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, there's some things we're looking forward to. There's some things that are guaranteed that are going to happen to the saved person. Now the next thing, I'm going to use a word here uh, that might catch you off guard. And I don't have time to go into the, I, I, I guess I have the time, but I don't want to take the time in this video to go into all the details of this. But I do want you to listen up to the fact that we are predestinated to three things. Now a Calvinist is going to say, oh, we're predestinated. Now, whenever you see the word predestinated in Scripture, I'm not talking about Calvinistic predestination. I'm talking about biblical predestination. Calvin Calvinists believe that lost people are predestinated to get saved. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that saved people are predestinated for three future things. And I'm going to show you what those three things are. First of all is your inheritance. Now we just covered that in 1 Peter chapter 4. The saved person... We say, I'm in Ephesians 1.11. We'll say, how do you know we're talking about a saved person? Because Paul is writing to saved people. In Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Saved people, Ephesians 1.11. He says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. If you are saved, if you are faithful in Christ Jesus, you are predestinated to an inheritance. Just like, just like we just talked about in 1 Peter uh, 1, verses 3 through 9. We are predestinated to an inheritance. In other words, there's a, just like Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. There's a place in heaven for you. And when New Jerusalem comes down, and when uh, the millennial reign takes place on this earth, there is a place for you. Uh, that is reserved and you are predestinated to that inheritance you will get it no matter what so that's the first thing we're predestinated to now that's saved people no so remember no lost people are predestinated to get saved saved people are predestinated for their inheritance coming in the future the next thing is the adoption we are predestinated to the adoption same chapter Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 having predestinated us who's us Save people. How do you know that? Because I can read verse 1 where it says, Saints and faithful in Christ Jesus, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And you say, Brother Kevin, don't you know that when you get saved, that's when you get adopted? And that means that we lost people are predestinated to get saved? No, I don't know that. Why don't I know that. Why don't I know that? Because I can read the Bible, and that's not what the Bible says adoption is. You are not adopted when you get saved. You are adopted later. How do I know that? Romans chapter 8, verse 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Remember that? We get the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for for the adoption. Saved people are waiting for the adoption. And then it defines it. To wit, the redemption of our body. The adoption is defined by the Apostle Paul, same person who wrote Ephesians 1.5, is defined as the redemption of our body. That is the adoption. You say, well, hold on. I thought we were adopted when we get saved. Well, just a second. If you back up in, in Romans chapter 8, what you have is the spirit of adoption. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Spirit. Remember the earnest, sealed by the spirit until the day of redemption? We have the spirit of redemption, the spirit that seals us to guarantee our redemption. Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So to endure with Christ, to allow Christ, to suffer with Christ, that we also may be glorified together. So you have the spirit of adoption. We get the same thing if you go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. You have the spirit of adoption. 
but the adoption you don't have yet. You're awaiting for the adoption. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, that is not predestinated lost people to get saved. That's predestinated saved people to the redemption of their body, guaranteeing that destination for you. The destination of having your body redeemed, you will make that destination. You will get there. You're predestinated for it. So that's the first thing, you're predestinated to your inheritance. Second thing, you're predestinated to the adoption. Saved people are predestinated to these things. And the third thing, a saved person is predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So if you're in Christ, if God knows you, he already foreknows, I want you to look at verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, all those things are past tense. You notice that? Called, justified. Uh, now look at the last one. Them he also glorified. You'll notice glorified is also past tense, but it has not happened yet. He knows you. You are predestinated for that to happen. Now I want to show you something. A lot of people have a problem with that, I'm going to Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. A lot of people have problems in Romans 8, 29 because of that word foreknew, but I want to show you something. In, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. Notice that? Jesus says to some people, depart from me, for I never knew you. And here it says, or rather that, it says, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. So for the saved person, there is a time when you, when God comes to know you. Uh, you I'm just reading scripture to you. That's just what it says. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, our presuppositions, our, even if you're not a Calvinist, our theology is flooded with Calvinist presuppositions because uh, they've heard things in church for so long they just repeat them. People think whom he did foreknow. Well, he foreknew. And then some uh, Arminians try to say, well, he foreknew that I would trust Christ. You know, like a Wesleyan Arminian will believe that, which is not scriptural. What this foreknow is here is that word, see that word glorified? You see that word uh uh, where we're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father. Okay? What happens is right now we're not glorified. But through Jesus Christ, through the promise of the Spirit, remember still in, verse, still in Romans 8, the Spirit of adoption, we're waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. God, for, right now, after you're saved... Because remember uh, Galatians 4.9, he doesn't know you till you're saved. After you're saved, he foreknows you as if you are already glorified. As if you are already conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. As if you already are sinless and have the redemption of the body. So whom he foreknew, saying that to save people. Whom God foreknew as already glorified, as already conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That what he's, de what he's doing here, all of this whole chapter, he's building confidence. He's establishing the confidence of the believer in Jesus Christ. That if you're in Christ, you can have complete confidence. You don't have to worry about it. We won't be separated from the love of God. He foreknows you as already glorified. And he predestinated you to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. The, the destination of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He predestinated you to that. So we're predestinated to three things. Save people. Remember, no lost people predestinated to get saved. That is not anywhere in Scripture. But saved people are predestinated to their inheritance, to the redemption of the body, the adoption, and to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, which has not happened yet. All three of those things are future things. They don't happen when you get saved. They happen later. And after you're saved, you are predestinated to those things. After you're saved, you are predestinated to those things once you're saved. So we covered the sealing of the Spirit. We covered, we're predestinated. We look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And now 
we notice that it's eternal life. Now I've got some other videos on salvation. I'm not going to cover the passages here, but there are plenty of passages in Scripture that talk about everlasting life and eternal life. That's what we believe. We don't believe it's temporary life. We don't believe it's pending life. We believe it is everlasting life. It is not temporary or pending, everlasting. So then we look at the timeline. There are some clues in Scripture where things change. Now, the Holy Spirit is the mechanism of our eternal security. And you should notice that in the New Testament, things are different from the way they are in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you have people like Balaam, you have people like King Saul, uh, people like Samson, where the Holy Spirit came and went, came and went. Now remember, we are sealed until the day of redemption. That is a blessing for us. That is during the church age, after Pentecost. They were not. It is different. Things changed. I want to show you an example. In John chapter 7, verse 39, it says, while well, I look at verse 38, Jesus says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay? Very next verse, verse 39, John 7, 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we see there are some, what we call in the army, trigger events. <laughs> The Holy Ghost's ministry of what he's doing right now is not going to happen until the trigger event of Jesus Christ being glorified. Raising from the dead, going to the Father, being glorified with the Father, like it says in John chapter 17. Now, what that means, if the Holy Spirit is sealing us till the day of redemption, at least in John 7, 39, it does not take a rocket science degree to deduct that what the Holy Ghost is doing now he was not doing then which means that before the Holy Ghost was given Acts chapter 2 nobody was being sealed by the Holy Spirit nobody was being sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption now that's where Bible believing Christianity parts from something uh, like uh, Hinduism or Calvinism because Calvinism has people being elect the exact same way all the time, every time, salvation happening all the time, the same way to everybody everywhere, whereas that's not what Scripture says. It's not what Scripture says at all. Uh, John the Baptist is handled a lot differently than you and I are. He had the Holy Ghost from the womb. We don't have the Holy Ghost from the womb. If, uh, why don't the elect just have the Holy Ghost from the womb? You ever thought about that? Why do they even have to be converted? If they were supposedly in Christ before the foundation, anyway, that's a whole other topic. I don't want to get into that right now. But when it comes to this matter, the holy, the, this operation of the Holy Ghost that makes eternal security possible only goes to a certain extent. It starts in Acts 2. Remember when Jesus says in Luke 24 in Acts chapter 1, he told the apostles to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise that they should receive from the Father. That is that the Holy Ghost would come to them, and the Holy Ghost came. Holy Ghost comes in Acts 2, and then the day of redemption, the catching away of the church, is the day of redemption. We are sealed until the day of redemption. At the day of redemption, there is no passage of Scripture which talks about anybody being sealed after that. I am premillennial, pre-trib. Um, that comes from a strict hermeneutic of Scripture. The, the more strict your hermeneutic is the more premillennial pre-trib you become interpreting scripture literally as you go not allegorizing anything and so what that means is Daniel's 70th week a lot of people call it the seven year tribulation period it's kind of a misnomer only the last half of that is actually called the great tribulation period but it's a seven year period a lot of to the Jews and it is Daniel's 70th week it happens after the church age the church is caught away after that uh, Daniel's 70th week happens. What that means is after the church is caught away, what's happening for our salvation right now is not happening after that. There's no guarantee that somebody is being sealed by the Spirit till their day of redemption, whatever it is. Before the church age, the Holy Spirit was not doing what he's doing today. So there is nothing in the Old Testament or before 
the crucifixion and resurrection in Acts 2, which says those people were being sealed by the Spirit till any day of redemption. So Christians have a, we have a problem sometimes, and, and people who do believe in eternal security are really big about making this problem. That is, once you find out something's true, like eternal security, it's a true doctrine, they try to put it everywhere, and they try to make every passage teach it. Here's the problem. Every passage does not teach it. So there are passages that talk about salvation prior to the crucifixion and resurrection. They're not going to match how salvation works for you. So when Jesus is talking, you have to notice he hadn't died yet. He hadn't risen from the dead yet. Acts 2 hasn't happened yet. When uh, later on, if you find a passage that is dealing with Daniel's 70th week, that is in what people call the tribulation period, in that, in that uh, seven-year period, that... Uh, is going to have some information in there that doesn't pertain to you. They might be told to endure to the end, uh, something like that. You're not told to endure to the end. That's something for Jews during the tribulation period. They might not endure to the end. They might stop and uh, go take the mark of the beast. And then you can look at Romans 14, 9 through 11 to see how that pans out for them. Um, or you can look at Hebrews 10, 26 through 28 to find out how that pans out for them. Or Hebrews chapter 6 to find out how that pans out for them. So when you find a passage of scripture that deals with something outside the church age, remember the Holy Spirit is not specifically said in scripture to be sealing those people till the day of redemption. Their salvation happens a little bit different than ours. In the future one day I'm going to do the four A's of salvation. Uh, appropriation, application, accession, and accessorization. The four A's of salvation and show how those can be applied as a mental framework where you can ask the question, how does, this, how does each one of these four work for, during these time periods? And you can see the difference. Um, so there are certain times. There are certain things you've got to watch out for in Scripture. Certain uh, waypoints, if you will. Once you cross, certain phase lines in the operation. First of all, does something happen before or after the cross? That's very important. Does something happen before or after Pentecost? That's very important. Jesus says in John chapter 20, after he rose from the dead, he breathes on his apostles and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. So, well, did he get the Holy Spirit then? Or did he get it in Acts 2? Or was this a re-rendering of Acts 2? Basically, he's given them the Holy Spirit, kind of like in the Old Testament sense, until the giving of the Spirit comes down in power like it does in Acts 2, which is then available to everyone. Does it happen before Pentecost? Does it happen after Pentecost? And then ask yourself this. If I'm looking at something, does it happen before Scripture is completed or after Scripture is completed? Now, obviously, if you're reading it in the Bible, it is happening before Scripture is completed. <laughs> and for us, after Scripture is complete, it is different than before Scripture is complete. So that's very important for the issue of eternal security. Not that big of a deal, but when it comes into the sign gifts and things like that, that's a big deal. And there's some other, like, uh, the, the next big phase line is the end of the church age. Is this talking about something that applies during the church age or something that is applicable after the church age? Now, I want to stop right here and I'm going to tell you this. As soon as you start showing people how things change in scripture, how the narrative adapts. As soon as you start showing people that, they will accuse you of not studying the whole Bible or not believing that we need the whole Bible or thinking things don't apply. And we don't believe that at all. We believe in the whole counsel of God. All 31,102 verses, all 788,257 words, all of it. We believe in all of it. And all of it applies somehow, but all of it might not apply directly. For example, um, do you buy cooking oil? You probably buy cooking oil. Um, why, don't, why aren't you like the widow in the Old Testament who had just a little bit and kept pouring it and it kept coming out? Because that only applies to her. It doesn't apply to us. Um, are you building a boat in your backyard? Are you building a big, huge boat it's a length of a football field and a half, so you can put a bunch of animals in it. You say, no, why not? Because God told that to Noah. Do you take your son up on, on a mountain and sacrifice him? No, because God told that to Abraham. See, not everything applies to you. You need to know it. There are certain things that apply to you, like from Noah, we can learn about faith. We can learn about perseverance, even when nobody gets on the boat with you, nobody believes the truth, nobody comes along for the ride. Uh, we learned that from Jeremiah and other people. There's lots of things you can learn. There's lots of things you can know. But not everything applies to you. Not everything is to you. 
So all the scripture is for you. All of it is for you. You should study all of it, but not all of it is to you. Did you know there's a book in the Bible called Hebrews? Are you a Hebrew? Did you know that the book of James is written to the 12 tribes? According to James chapter 1, verse 1, are you one of the 12 tribes? Think about that. Think about that. In the Daniel 70th week is to the Hebrews. It is to the Jews. It is, to, it is about the 12 tribes. So ask yourself these questions. There's these waypoints. The cross, Pentecost, is scripture complete? And are we at the end of the church age? Are we in the church age? Are we after the church age? Has the rapture happened or has it not happened? That sort of thing. So then when you look at things like John 7, 39, these are indicators of change, indicators of things that change in the timeline, where it says, This spake he of the Spirit, which he, they that should believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. I've never heard anybody, especially Calvinists, they don't talk about that a lot. They don't talk about what was different before and after the Holy Spirit comes. You want to know why? Let me tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because in the previous chapter, they make a big deal out of John chapter 6, verse 44. I'll go ahead and go there. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. They say, see, the Holy Spirit has to draw you or you can't come. Or you won't come. That kind of thing. You know. Well, first of all, there's a problem there. It doesn't say Holy Spirit in that verse. It says Father. And don't you think Jesus knows the difference between the Holy Spirit and the Father? He talks about himself, the Father, and the Holy Spirit all very distinctly in the book of John. If he meant Holy Spirit, he would have said it. And by the way, when he says this, it's chapter 6. The next chapter, chapter 7, is where it says the Holy Spirit was not yet given. And a Calvinist may have to have this explained to them because Calvinists are not that bright, but seven comes after six, which means that six came before seven, which means in John chapter six, verse 44, the Holy Spirit was not yet given. So that passage could not possibly be about the Holy Spirit doing anything. It's about the Father. There's two entities of the Trinity, if you want to use the term Trinity, don't get hung up on that. The Trinity is not in the Bible. Just hang with me there for a second. There's two entities of the Trinity which draw, the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit never draws. And for those people who quote John 15, 26 to try to say that's the Holy Spirit drawing, go back to kindergarten and first grade and learn how to read. Because the Holy Spirit never draws anybody in the New Testament. The Father and the Son do the drawing. And the Son... After the, he says, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. That's what happens after the, after the crucifixion. Remember those waypoints? Something changes after the waypoint. The Father draws before the crucifixion and resurrection, not the Holy Spirit. After the crucifixion and resurrection, the Son draws. So pay attention to things like that. Pay attention to things like John 7, 39, when things change. So the mechanism of eternal security is something that is specific it is done by the Holy Spirit. It is an operation of the Holy Spirit. And that is what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to baptize us into Christ, which was not happening before Acts 2 and will not happen after the catching away of the church. So I have in my notes here, and I think I already talked about this, is the danger of finding something true and you try to cram it everywhere else in Scripture. So we want to make sure we don't do that. Eternal security is not taught in... Genesis chapter 7 <laughs> necessarily it's, it might be pictured there you know I understand things like that is not taught in, in Ezekiel chapter 18 Ezekiel chapter 33 when people want to refute eternal security what they usually do is they go pick a passage out from the Old Testament like Ezekiel 33 Ezekiel 18 or or something in reference to the tribulation period Daniel's 70th week like out of Matthew 24 or something like that, they try to take something that is, doesn't even apply to the church age, is not aimed at the church age, is not to the church age, and they will try to refute eternal security. Basically what they're admitting when they do that is that they have no idea how the Bible is put together, uh, and they haven't spent a whole lot of time in it. I want to talk about ecclesiology for a second, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Well, 
I uh, should do a whole video on this, but basically the church in Israel, church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. Blindness of part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And when that happens, the catching away of the church, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then God will switch back to the Jews. See, God only turned to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. Romans chapter 10, verse 19, Deuteronomy 32, 21. Um, and that's going to work. And the Gentiles, the Gentile church age, Jew, Gentile, no distinction between them, is going to have a role in causing Israel to turn back to God. And the Daniel 70th week is all about Israel coming back to God. Now, people who do not believe, people who don't basically don't believe in Scripture, they don't have a strict hermeneutic. They believe in something called replacement theology, where the church replaces Israel. And then they get all confused on their eschatology because of their ecclesiology. And when they're confused on their eschatology and ecclesiology, they get confused on their soteriology. Because soteriology to a different ecclesiastic period happens differently. When God's dealing with the nation of Israel before Jesus comes, nobody's sealed by the Spirit to the day of redemption. Nobody is in Christ. Nobody is the bride of Christ. Nobody is the body of Christ. Abraham is the friend of God. He's not the bride of Christ. He's not in Christ. During the church age, we're the bride of Christ. We're the body of Christ. After the church age, after the catching away, they will not be in Christ. They will not be the bride of Christ. That is some, that The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. We are bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, before the church, after the church, none of those things. And so when you start blending things that are different, uh, you come across all sorts of problems. And then pretty soon you basically wind up making God out to be a liar. Most Calvinists are replacement theologians. They believe the church replaces Israel. They got their ecclesiology wrong. That's why they got their eschatology wrong. And that's why they got their soteriology wrong. They get their ecclesiology wrong because they're believing in a philosophy outside of scripture. And they bring their philosophy to scripture instead of getting doctrine from scripture. We should come to the scripture asking God what he has to tell us. But people who have false doctrine, like our Calvinist friends, they go to Scripture having, basically telling God how he needs to operate his sovereignty. And he's got little limits. He must do it this way, or he's, or he's not God, not sovereign, that kind of thing, which is just absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> and so things different are not the same. That is, uh, you, sh you should memorize that and say that often. In Scripture, things different are not the same, not the same at all. And the kingdom of heaven is not the kingdom of God. Before the church is not during the church. Israel is not the church. God dealing with a nation is not the same as God dealing with individuals. The things different are not the same. Before the Holy Spirit is not the same as after the Holy Spirit came. <laughs> and while the Holy Spirit's here is not the same as when the Holy after the day of redemption. So it's ba it sounds basic, but it's the basics. It's the fundamentals like that they you know they say that yeah, you win you win championships in basketball by paying attention to the fundamentals it's little basic fundamentals and i'm not talking about the five fundamentals of faith or fundamentalism i'm talking about the fundamentals of knowing how to read that's the kind of fun i'm talking about fundamentals of linguistics and syntax and subjects and verbs <laughs> those are kind of fundamentals i'm talking about things different are not the same well, how do you know it's not the same it's a different word it's spelled different it's means something different in the dictionary things different are not the same so don't don't get a don't get those things confused interesting thing on ecclesiology in psalm 45 if you want to look into that so i want to talk for a second now about why eternal security is not the same as the p in tulip and the p in tulip is practically the same as arminianism if you're in christ the, the way the bible works if you're in christ till the day of redemption you are in christ and I don't want you to take me the wrong way. This does not mean that you can go live like the devil. Uh, you won't lose your salvation. If you're really in Christ, no matter what you do, you're in Christ. And you can't get out. I'm not trying to say that to you. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But Arminianism, which is not Bible-believing Christianity, they teach that you can lose your salvation. You can be in Christ one minute and then you can either lose faith. Or you know, some people think you can sin it if you sin enough. You get rid of it, or if you lose faith, is you know different groups have different ways you can lose your salvation. I'll tell you this: if you can lose your salvation, 
you would lose it. And if you can, you will. The devil had no problem with Simon Peter. He's going to have no problem with you. He'd been dealing with men for 6,000 years, and if he didn't want you saved, uh, he'd have no problem getting you to send away your salvation or lose faith to get rid of it. So if you can lose it, you will go ahead and get ready for hell, because that's what's going to happen to you. But the good news is we can't lose it. Once you're in Christ, you're really in Christ, you're really secure, you're bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, and, he can't, and you can't lose it. And Arminian, uh, will, Arminian theology will teach that you can lose it. If you re resist your sanctification, you can lose your salvation. So one minute you're saved, the next minute you're lost. You're not saved. Now Calvinism... Now, when Calvinists, if they're listening to this video, they're going to they're gonna squeal and strip out their gears and burn up their clutch plate when they hear me say this. But they basically believe the same thing in practical terms. So, no, we don't. No, we don't. We believe that the elect are eternally secure in Christ. Yes, of course. They believe the elect are eternally secure in Christ. But listen to this. They have nothing in Scripture guaranteeing that they are the elect. They have nothing in Scripture guaranteeing that Christ died for them and that they can even trust Christ. So you, they cannot look to Scripture, say, oh, Christ died for me. They can't trust that. They don't know for sure that Christ died for them. They don't know if they're the elect. So they have to trust that they're elect. That's what they're trusting. You can't trust Christ as a Calvinist. I know they say they do, but they have nothing in writing from God, who can't lie, telling them Christ died for them. So what their faith must rely on is that they are elect. Now, the only evidence they have for being elect, since they don't have scripture, there's no promise in scripture they can rely on, the only evidence they can rely on is their works, just like an Arminian. Now, the P in tulip is not, uh, it, it is the perseverance of the saints. Now, some Baptist Calvinists change it to preservation of the saints, like God preserves and if they want to change, they're trying to change it to make it more scriptural. But originally, it's perseverance of the saints. And what that means is that if you're truly elect, you will persevere in good works. Now, play this out with me. If they don't know they're elect, and they start sinning, or they lose faith, or something happens, say something horrible happens in their life, they lose a child, they lose faith in God, something like that, they get mad, all of a sudden, oh, I'm, I guess I was never elect because I sinned away. I, I started sinning, and elect people don't live this way. Elect people don't go out drinking every night and whoring around, and elect people don't lose faith. Whatever it is, they think they not elect anymore. It's just like Arminianism. They are looking to their own works to indicate to them whether or not they're saved. An Arminian starts sinning, loses faith, I once was saved, I now am lost. A Calvinist starts sinning, loses faith. Oh, I'm not persevering in good works. I must be lost. I once thought I was saved, and now I think I'm lost. It's the same. It's exactly the same. Both systems are looking to their works as an indicator of whether or not they're saved. They're not looking to the promises of God. They're looking to their own works. Now, an Arminian... Uh, at the extreme end, will think that their own works are keeping them saved. A Calvinist does not actually believe doctrinally that their works are keeping them saved, but they believe that their works are the indicator that they are saved. But practically it's the same. Once you, they, they both are looking to their works, they're not looking to the Word of God, they're not, they don't trust the earnest of the Spirit, because the Calvinist doesn't know if he has the earnest of the Spirit. He doesn't know if Christ died for him. He doesn't know any of that stuff. He hopes he's elect, and he has to look to his work to find out if he's elect. And if his works pan out, then there's a pretty good chance I must be elect. <laughs> so, uh, Calvinism, so the P in TULIP is not eternal security. It is not the scriptural eternal security. For practical purposes, it is just like the denominations that believe you can lose your salvation. Not doctrinally. They don't doctrinally believe that, but practically it's exactly the same. Practically it's identical. Practically the person thinks they're saved, fall into sin, and then they think they're not. Practically, it's identical. I know they're not going to like that. But. And then we get this idea of antinomianism. What about people who saved and then... I got an email here. I'm going to read an email. got an email from Edgar. And Edgar says, 
Uh, hello, Pastor Kevin. Thank you for your videos. They have been instrumental in helping me understand Calvinism. I have a close family member that is a Calvinist, and at first I didn't know his belief had a name, but I just knew his doctrine was off and evidently came to know it was Calvinism. So this guy's got some discernment, and uh, apparently he's been reading his Bible. I have a question regarding salvation and was hoping you could help. What would you say about people that don't live holy? A holy Christian life but say that they believe and trust God as their savior. I have family members that grew up in church, Pentecostal, and to Pentecostal believer, a person who, does not, who doesn't live their standards must not be saved. Calvinists believe they must persevere in good works to be considered part of the elect. Okay, so you see what I just told you is, is common knowledge. If they party, if they drink, if they curse, etc., and say they believe in Christ and have faith in, have faith in Christ, he is their savior, are they saved? I know that we can't do anything to earn salvation, but should there be some evidence in our lives to show that we are disciples of Christ? Do you have a video that includes this topic? I'm making it right now. <laughs> I'm still in the process of reviewing all your videos. Thank you, Pastor Edgar. All right, Edgar, thanks for watching. Thanks for the email. And that's uh, one of the reasons that spurned this along. So what about those people who say it's, it's called antinomianism? And we look at, uh, let's see here, we'll look at uh, Romans chapter, not typing it out, <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 8. It says, and not rather, as we being slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do good that evil may come, whose damnation is just. In other words, that is a, even back then in Romans chapter 3, there's a slander going around that uh, let us do evil that good may come. <laughs> We're saying... Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So obviously I think we all agree that no saved person should be living in sin. But then what about those who do? And I'll tell you right off the bat, I, as a human, and you, we, we can't tell whether or not somebody else is saved. But the, the saved human has both natures they have the human nature and they have the new nature of the new birth if they're truly saved if we go to romans chapter 7 the very next chapter or a few chapters down from romans chapter 3 where we just were if we look at some things that paul said now this is paul paul said in verse 14 romans 7 14 for we know that the law is spiritual but I, as a saved person, Paul, if anybody was saved, Paul was saved, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that sin, but it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do not that what I would, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And basically the point is, you got both natures with you. You're, yeah, you're saved. If you're, if you're in Christ, you're saved. But your flesh has not been glorified. You remember one of the definitions of sin in Scripture, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Right now, everything you do is short of the glory of God. When you wake up and you're, you behave perfectly toward your wife and toward your kids, and you put on a suit and tie, and you go to church, and you do exactly what you're supposed to, that does not achieve the glory of God. And by definition, that is sin. Our best efforts, even after we are saved, fall short of the glory of God which is why we need a savior to begin with. Paul said, I'm carnal, sold under sin. Romans chapter 6, 7, and the beginning of 8 is about the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, not to get saved, but practically how we live. Your flesh wants to do one thing, your flesh wants to sin, and your spirit wants to do right. And we must yield to the spirit so that we do right and don't give in to the flesh which wants to sin. So that's how a Christian should operate. But we do know that there are those Christians who give into the flesh. What happens to them? 
In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Sin brings death. The very same chapter, we know that Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I know we quote that, you know, people do the whole Romans Road thing, and they quote that to the lost person, like your sin is going to bring the second. But actually, this is to a saved person. The wages of your sin bring death, bring physical damnation. The word condemnation shows up in Scripture. Condemnation, damnation, very similar. Uh, remember Romans or 1 Corinthians 11 talking about the Lord's Supper he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not damnation in hell temporal damnation in other words while you are on this earth sin still has consequences if you smoke crack you will fry your brain and being saved does not make that consequence go away if you cheat on your wife you will damage that relationship and you may catch a disease and someone may get pregnant. Those are just consequences. And uh, being saved does not make consequences go away. And the consequences of sin uh, will wreak havoc on the saved person. Because there is something called chastening. Now if you keep going in Romans, if we look a little bit at chapter 7, chapter 8 verse 13, Paul says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Like John says in 1 John 5, uh, there is a sin unto death. <laughs> if you keep sinning, if you live into the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit you do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So if God decides, one way we always say it in our church, it's kind of a joke we have, God's either going to take you home and crown you, or he's going to crown you and take you home. <laughs> um, so one way or another, you're getting home. Uh, but whether or not you do it, in a good way or not is, is something else. First Corinthians chapter five verse five we have an we have a scenario where a Christian in a church, presumed Christian, you and I don't know whether or not for somebody say, but so there comes a point in time where practically we treat somebody like they're lost uh, for the sake of getting their attention and trying to get them to reconcile with with the church. Um, here in First Corinthians chapter five verse five. Uh, this guy is committing fornication with his father's wife. I hope it's his stepmother, not his actual mother. But nonetheless, it's just any kind of fornication shouldn't be taking place. And Paul, in verse 5, makes the judgment, the pronouncement. He says, to deliver... Now, he's doing this under apostolic authority. He says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So the spirit is saved... The flesh can be destroyed. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. So if you, the idea is that if you sin and don't live for the Lord, you're going to die. The Lord's going to deal with you. The Lord's going to chasten you. The Lord's either going to bring you back into his will, or he's uh, going to do something about it. In Hebrews chapter five, 12, verses 5 through 8, it says, Despise not the chastening of the Lord. He's quoting Proverbs three eleven, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And, uh, if the Lord didn't chasten you, in other words, do things in your life to bring you, take you off the sinful path and put you back on the path of sanctification, if he didn't do that to you, um, you'd be a bastard and not a son. And when you see a Christian uh, living like the devil and they wind up dying, getting in a car accident, something like that, it's probably good evidence that they're saved. That's, uh, once again, I can't tell whether or not somebody else for sure is saved, but there comes a point in time Practically, all you can do is practically, if, if a person is living like an unsaved person, then in the church, we would kick them out of the church. So you're living like a lost person. We can't have you spreading the testimony of Christ or in the name of our church like this with this kind of behavior. So we're going to treat you like a lost person until you start acting like a saved person and, and repent back toward God, that sort of thing. <laughs> I actually had a lady get upset with me when I was in Texas because we had just finished a lesson on eternal security and later on a lady called me back and she said well her husband my husband took what you said and he went off and now he's uh, doing all kinds of things that she listed that are sins that some a Christian shouldn't be doing saying that because you taught eternal security and because you know you're safe in Christ that he's going out and doing whatever he can because he thinks he's safe now and that's 
that's a complete misrepresentation of uh, what I said. I never taught. I never taught that there were no consequences. She tried to make it sound like there were no consequences, anything like that. But here's the point: whether or not something is true is all we should be concerned with. How people misuse it is not really the concern, as long as we paint the full true picture. Our our concern should be whether or not it's scripture, whether or not it's true. And it's almost like, even though eternal security is true, people are willing to teach that you can lose your salvation so that they can have a fear tactic to keep some people under control. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need a fear tactic to keep people under control. Our job is to preach the truth. We're not trying to control people's behavior. That's between them and God. Our job is to preach the truth. And uh, my own personal experience uh, in regards to cooperating with all kinds of different other denominations or working alongside of people of other denominations, I found that the people who believe in eternal security the biblical way actually live holier, cleaner, more pure lives than those who don't. But the point is, it's, it's not what people do with it or uh, how people misuse the doctrine. It's whether it's true or not. If it's scriptural, teach it. If it's not, don't. Don't hide something scriptural so that you can use something else as a tactic, as a fear tactic to control people's behavior because you think that's what you got to do. That's never the right way to go about things. There's a very famous passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. Now it's all about salvation by grace through faith. Look at what comes right after it. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we use, all that time, we use that all the time in soul winning, right? Tell people how salvation works, by grace through faith. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God ordained that we should walk in good works after we're saved. Now, do we? I hope so. But Paul said, I'm carnal, soul under sin. So do we always? No, we don't always. Which shows you right there that the ordinances of God are not these immutable decrees like Calvinists say they are. Uh, it's, it's just the prescribed method of, that God lays out for us. But God ordained that we should walk in good works. Anybody who is saved should strive to live for the Lord, to please Jesus Christ, to be edified, to edify other saints, and to win the lost. Every, every saved person should do that, and if they don't, God will deal with them. If they're truly saved, a saved person has the potential to yield to the flesh and do everything a lost person would do. That doesn't mean they should. It doesn't mean we should, and the, and the church, the local assembly, should do something about that. And if you find somebody who's just carelessly living that way, we should treat them as if they are unsaved. We can't see their heart. We don't know whether they really are or not. But if I find somebody who's living like the devil, it's, I can't say they're not saved or they never have been. So I wouldn't take that chance. Don't be like the Arminians and say, uh, oh, you lost your salvation, you don't have it. And don't be like the Calvinists who uh, say, oh, you never were elect. Because you can't know that. You can't know that. What we do have is Scripture. And we do see in Scripture that saved people can sin. They can reject their sanctification and not cooperate with it. And God deals with them. Now, the extent to what God deals with them and how he does it and how he works out his purpose is up to him. But that's what's going on. So we don't, we don't uh, advocate any of this. <laughs> uh, living like the devil. We call it antinomianism. Completely get, not, not having any standards or rules to live by. Now, if you have standards or rules to live by, those things are about, about your testimony, about pleasing Jesus Christ. You can't get saved or stay saved by having any standards or rules to live by, but you can stay within certain boundaries so that you have a more edifying testimony, a more evangelistic testimony, a more Christ-pleasing testimony and, uh, by the way you live and things like that. So you can't lose your salvation. But what can you lose? As a Christian, you can lose your reward. You can lose your reward in heaven. You can lose your family. You can lose your health. You can lose your testimony. You can lose your reputation. You can lose your ministry. You can lose your longevity. You can die young. You can lose your job. You can lose your mind. You can lose all sorts of things. You say, well, I can't lose my salvation. I'm good to go. There's lots of things you can lose. And uh, 
if you're in Christ, you're still going to reap the consequences of sin if you live in sin, and it's going to cost you a reward. Instead of having gold, silver, precious stones, 1 Corinthians 3, at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll just have wood, hay, and stubble that's going to burn up. You're not going to have anything to show. Now, after all Christ did for us, dying on the cross, following the law completely perfectly, dying on the cross, suffering, not only dying on the cross, but then, uh, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 27 and 31, and Psalm 16, he went down into hell, and is the only being that could overcome and conquer hell of his own accord, and come back out, did all that for us. When you get to heaven, you're going to want some kind of reward to cast back at his feet. And the shame we as Christians will feel when we have nothing to cast back at his feet is, is a shame, I dare say, you don't want to experience. If you're saved, live for Christ. Don't, don't make Christ deal with, uh, have to deal with you or punish you, uh, that kind of thing. And I also want to say that even if you are saved, uh, you, can, you can trust Scripture that you're saved if you're saved. Christ did die for you. God does love you, and uh, if you trusted Jesus Christ, you're saved, or God's a liar. So if you're saved and you do live in sin, you will doubt your salvation, and you will have problems with the confidence of the believer. So just, so, just know that people who uh, consistently live in sin, um, they do have problems, they doubt, they're constantly doubting their salvation, am I really saved? So that sort of thing. So bear that in mind. So you say, well, Brother Kevin, aren't there passages that say uh, people can't inherit the kingdom of God? So we'll talk about those for a second. But I do want to say this. When we talk about proof texts, and I don't like that phrase at all, uh, we need to follow the, the flow of the passage, not just look at proof texts. But when we talk about passages that teach eternal security, and then people who don't believe in eternal security, don't you know they have passages for what they believe to? So... If I have passages that teach eternal security and they have passages that teach against eternal security, doesn't the Bible have contradictions? No. Because basically they're misunderstanding and misinterpreting Scripture. So we don't want to just pit Scripture against Scripture like Martin Luther used to do with the, with the Catholics. They would, he would hit them with Romans 4, 5 and they'd hit him with James 2, 24. And they'd go back and forth like one of them is more true than the other one. <laughs> Uh, that, that's not the case. So what we need to do is find, when you come across those passages that people who don't understand the Bible are using to teach that uh, God does not keep them saved, uh, that it relies on their works or something like that, learn how to properly interpret and explain those passages within the framework that Scripture lays out for us. Don't just fight Scripture against Scripture as if they contradict or go against each other. Show how they come together um, and, and correlate and supplement and complement each other. So there's these passages. Uh, Ephesians 5.5 5 says, Don't you know that or this you know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ? Well, what if you're saved and you're an idolater? Does that mean you have no inheritance in Christ? It means you're not going to heaven? That's not what it says. Does it say, uh, don't you know that an idolater is not saved? Does not have eternal life? That's not what it says. When I covered this in, in church, that's how I read it, just to make people pay attention. Don't, don't you know that a covetous man or an, who is an idolater hath, <laughs> that no, no person who does these things hath eternal life? That's not what it says. It doesn't say they don't have eternal life. It says they have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, Christ and of God. Well, what does that mean? Let's look at some more in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Now, people who don't believe in eternal security, they're going to throw these at you. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit eternal life. Notice what it says and what it does not say. Remember when we talked about things different are not the same? What does this mean? Well, I'll show you. I'll show you in just a second. I want to cover these, and we'll get to it. 
Envyings, murder, this is Galatians 5, 21. Paul's going through his list of vices and virtues. He, hits, he usually hits his vices first, then the virtues. Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is the virtues. So here he's still in the vices, and he says, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit eternal life. That's not what it says. It says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What does this mean? And there's a clue in Colossians 3.24. It says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Remember, a reward is something that can be lost. In 2 John 8. That didn't work well. In 2 John 8. It says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. The things that you have wrought, it's possible to lose your reward. It's very possible to lose your reward. Colossians 3.24, knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. There's an aspect of the inheritance, just your home in heaven, that you will definitely inherit a place there. But not everybody will rule and reign with Christ. That kind of inheritance. When you're talking about a monarchy and somebody, uh, the heir of the king, say, well, they inherited the kingdom. Does that mean that the other siblings get kicked out of the kingdom? Does that mean that the cousins and other squires of people don't have a place, don't have a room in the kingdom? No. They're just not ruling over it. We can rule and reign with Christ. That's part of the reward. Or, we can just go. <laughs> go to our eternal life in the kingdom. I want to show you the tale of two passages of scripture. I've got on one side, Luke 19, the parable of the pounds. And on the other side, I've got Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents. Now, if you go to most churches, they will talk of they will speak of these interchangeably like they're the same thing but remember things different are not the same matthew is very jewish luke has more of a gentile flavor to it let's look at matthew matthew chapter 25 verse 14 for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents to another two and to another one. So far I've got three servants and each of them got a different amount of talents, different quantity of talents. To every man according to his several ability and straightforward he took his journey. Now look over here in Luke. Luke chapter 19 verse 12, he said therefore a certain nobleman went forth into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants. Now there were three that got stuff on the other one, there's ten here, and delivered them ten pounds and said, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom. Now notice there's a difference between his servants and his citizens. Two different things. Citizens, Israel. He came into his own and his own received him not. John 1.11 but as many as received him, servants, Christians. Now pounds, notice this is an English Bible put out by an English king, and the English, the sun never set on the English empire, all the, all the commerce today, and the official language of diplomacy is English. And it says pounds, for English speaking people, this is for English speaking people, pounds. There's some clues here. You know, God's still on the throne, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> But his citizens hated him, his Jews, rejected him, had him crucified, and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called to him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. So there's ten servants here. And each one got one of the ten pounds. That is different than Matthew. In Matthew, there are talents, 
and there were three, and they got different amounts, different quantities. And I say, why, why do you say they're different when they're so similar? Because they're different words, and they're spelled different. <laughs> they're different, all right? Now, anybody ought to see this. Fundamentals, remember the fundamentals. Not the fundamentals of the faith, not the fundamentals of Christianity, not the fundamentals of fundamentalism, but the fundamentals of being able to read. Fundamentals, all right? Fundamentals of knowing how to read can clear up a seminary education and get you back on track with Christianity. That's for sure. So it goes through thy pound hath gained ten spent. Let's look back over here at uh, Matthew for a second. So he gives the five talents and uh, verse 16. Then he that received the five talents went and traded the same and made five other talents. Likewise, he that received two also gained other two. Verse 18, but he that received the one went and digged it in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. Now notice as servants, there's no, there's no citizens mentioned here. Okay? This is about, this is different. This is Daniel's 70th week. Different. No citizens here. Different. Things different are not the same. Verse 20, 25, 20, Matthew. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord saith unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he that said, and he that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord, said, well, his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And then the guy that received the one talent, verse 24. He came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gather, gathering where thou hast not straw, and I was afraid. And I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there, hast, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Servant, not citizen. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered. Where I strawn, where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him which hath ten talents. So some good socialism for you there. For unto every one that hath shall be given to him that hath abundance, but from him that hath not shall be given, shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now the weeping and gnashing of teeth is obviously a reference to how the Lord describes hell and Gehenna. Uh, <laughs> this guy goes to hell. Take the unprofitable servant cast him into hell. That is for a Jew in the tribulation. Servant. There's no distinction in Matthew 25 between servants and citizens. That's not the way the story is going. He's dealing with Jews once again. And he's calling them servants. And that's, that's what happens to the unprofitable servant. Now let's go back over here to Luke and find out what happens for us Gentiles during the church age. And we go through this thing where, you know, the verse 16, Luke 19, 16, Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful over very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Now, I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana, so this could be, hey, you are now the mayor over New Orleans and the mayor over Baton Rouge and the mayor over, uh, I really wouldn't want New Orleans, at least not here. Maybe it'll be better in the millennium. But in the millennium, you see, when you die, we talk about dying and going to heaven, but that's really, for a Christian, it's only going to be a short amount of time. We're actually going to come back during the millennial reign of Christ, and we're going to rule and reign with him. And based on how faithful you are here, you will rule and reign with Christ. That's your inheritance that you'll get. So whatever pounds you've been given here, whatever resources are at your disposal to serve Christ here, use them for Christ, make something of them. And when Christ comes back and finds that you've been faithful, you will have the reward of the inheritance, which is to rule and reign with Christ. Okay? Verse, and the second came, saying, verse 18, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. So those who serve Christ at different capacities, they're going to rule and reign with Christ at, at different levels and different capacities. Going to, they're going to have a reward. And another came, verse 20, and said, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. But I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. 
and thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou dost not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury, or interest, if you will. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds, and you know that this does not make for good socialism and communism. Have you been paying attention to those things that are politically correct? For I say unto you that every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Remember the citizens? We will not have this man to reign over this, uh, reign over us. So those guys get killed. What happens to the guy who only had the one pound? Nothing. Now if you think otherwise, find it in the text. But nothing is said about the disposition of that person. And that's like the Christian who is saved but does not do anything with what God puts at his disposal. You'll go to heaven. You won't be cast into outer darkness like the guy in Matthew 25. That's Jewish, Daniel's 70th week. That's when that's going to happen. But you won't be reigning over ten cities either. You'll be in the millennium. You'll be a, a citizen of that kingdom. You'll be glorified and like Christ. But you won't have a reward. You won't have anything to cast back at Jesus' feet. You won't be able to rule and reign. You'll just be there. Uh, not sure exactly what you'll do. But you'll lose your reward. And that's not what you want to see happen. I'm going to show you one more passage. And then we'll be done... This is, a, this, is a, this is a fun one here. But I had to show you what I just showed you in order for this one to make sense because a lot of people take this one here. I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and I'm starting in verse 10. And don't, uh, Calvinists and uh, Arminians alike love this one. Paul says here, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. <laughs> uh that gets into what we are talking about a second ago. And so people who believe you can lose your salvation, uh, the Calvinists will put it this way. They'll say, uh, for the elect who haven't been saved yet, I endure all things so that these elect will come to Christ. And that's the duty of a Christian. People accuse us of not being evangelist evangelistic, but we believe that we should be. And we're trying to get all those elect to come to Christ. You know, <laughs> that's, that's how they'll twist it. And the Arminian will say, the people who are already saved, I endure all things for the elect's sake, those who are already saved, so that they can obtain salvation within Christ Jesus, because I don't want them to lose it. <laughs> okay? Neither one of those are true. Those are absolutely ridiculous. The key, to the, the key to the verse here is the phrase, with eternal glory. In other words, with reigning over ten cities. With reigning over five cities. I used the illustration when I was preaching on this tub subject in... Uh, in our church, New Orleans Bible Church, a few weeks ago, um, I had a, a V8 Camaro, a, a 2SS Camaro, and it had a V8 in it, and it was a 2011, it had the little divot in the hood, and I taught my kids how to spot a V8 Camaro. They had looked for that little divot in the hood, or right in front of the hood. And so we look around and we see Camaros that did not have the little divot, the little sissy V6 Camaros, and then we see Camaros that did have the divot in the hood, you know, masculine, manly. In other words, that Camaro with, uh, with eternal glory. In other words, so imagine everyone's going to get a Camaro when they die, but if you behave properly, you'll get a Camaro with a, that's a V8 that has a little divot in the hood, so you can show the power that you have. That's just a funny little illustration to kind of show what's going on here. Everyone, all the Christian, all the elect, there's two elects, Israel and Christ. And you are elect just as Christ is elect if you are in him. So the elect's sake, Christ and those in him, endure all things. And that's what we Christians do. We want to edify other Christians, build them up to please Christ better, to be more effective with their Christianity, so that when they get there, so that they can obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Not so they can obtain salvation. That's not where it stops. They want them to attain it with, with eternal glory. In other words, we want them to obtain salvation 
with ruling over 10 cities, with ruling over five cities, with ruling over two cities, with being faithful over many things. I'll make thee ruler faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. That's what he's saying here. So it's, uh, it's like the it's like a icing on a cupcake. Imagine everybody's going to get a cupcake, but I want you to obtain your cupcake with the icing. So everyone's going to so here same way that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's that with eternal glory, the glorification. There's more glorification if you live right as a Christian. Verse 11 it's a faithful saying for if we be dead with him we shall also live with him. In other words, we're crucified with Christ. You're going to die. You die in Christ, just as Christ rose from the dead. He's the prototype. He's the first fruits. You're going to rise from the dead because he did. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. You see there, Brother Kevin, it says he'll deny us if we deny him. Look at the context. If we suffer, in other words, if we allow, the word suffer, in the in a English Bible, means to allow, to permit, to let. If we suffer with him, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. In other words, if we allow Christ to work through us, for it is him that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians chapter 2, if we allow him to work through us, we suffer him to work through us, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Deny us what? deny us reigning with him. So if you allow Christ to work through you, you rule over 10 cities, you rule over five cities. If you deny letting Christ work through you, you don't rule over 10 cities or five cities. And whatever you do have, you lose your reward and it's given to somebody else. You're saved, you go to heaven, you're part of the body of Christ. The Lord loves you, but there's no reward. You can send away your reward, you can lose your reward. In the very next passage, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. And there's things that, like the disciple said, Lord, increase our faith. There's certain things in scripture that you may come across that you find hard to believe. And you may not believe all the promises of God. You, you know you should, you know you want to, but and we're, we're sinful humans. And that's sometimes we don't believe the things that we should, one of the sins that we commit. And uh, it doesn't automatically mean you don't believe in Jesus Christ, don't believe in death, burial, and resurrection, but it possibly could. Imagine you're saved, and something happens to you, you have a terrible accident, and you wake up and have amnesia, you forget everything, and then as you redevelop your brain, you develop it as an unbeliever. Now that's just a scenario. I don't know if that's ever happened. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> that's a, a scenario where once you're in Christ, you're in Christ no matter what. Brain damage is not going to put you out of Christ. That sort of thing. If you believe not, if you lose faith. Now when it comes to those people who, they say they were a Christian, now they're this big atheist apologist, like some of those Christian singers, I'm now an atheist, or I used to be a Christian, but now I'm an atheist. Now I would personally not think they were possibly ever, probably never ever, never really saved. And yeah, I can't judge that. But we live in an age today where going to church and calling yourself a Christian really doesn't mean much because the status and the state of the Christian church, especially in America of 2016, is in absolutely horrid shape. And uh, most, most churches aren't preaching the truth. Most churches aren't teaching and preaching Bible truth. And so when people leave Christianity... They're not really leaving Jesus Christ. They're leaving a false mis uh, they're leaving a misrepresentation of Christ. They're leaving a false Christianity that they may have never had it to begin with. So I, I can't sit here and tell you whether or not somebody is saved or lost if they start living like the devil or if they claim to no longer have faith, that sort of thing. Uh, usually if somebody loses faith, so a lot of times it's because of a horrible accident that happens. I heard of a case one time where uh, somebody lost a somebody lost a kid in a farming accident. They lost one of their children, and the parent, who had been a faithful Christian for many many years, suddenly they suddenly became atheist for a while. And it really, it was a 
it was a bitterness thing, it was a rebellious thing. Later on, they came back around. They, they, didn't, they weren't really an atheist. They were just acting out in bitterness because part of the grieving process, whatever you want to call it. So we sin. We sin. So just to kind of recap what happens, uh, the mechanism of eternal security is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not given before it was given, <laughs> according to John chapter 7, verse 39. Remember, things different are not the same. We are predestinated to three things if you're in Christ. That is our inheritance, the adoption, which is the redemption of the body, and to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Eternal life is eternal life, everlasting life. It's not temporary. It's not pending. Remember the timeline? There are certain things you want to pay attention to, whether it's before or after the cross, before or after Pentecost, before or after Scripture is complete, and before or after the end of the church age, before or after the rapture, if you will, the catching away of the church. Remember, there's a danger in finding something to be true and trying to force it everywhere in Scripture. Just because eternal security is true does not mean every passage teaches it. Every passage is not to us, but every passage is for us. Okay? People trying to cram all kinds of disparate things into some little man-defined theological box, and we don't want to try to do that. We let Scripture speak for itself. We covered why the why eternal security is not the same as the P in Calvinist tulip. It is not perseverance of the saints. It is eternal security, eternal confidence in Christ. We talked about antinomianism, the idea that you get saved, you get saved and careless, and you live like the devil, and God will chastise people who live like the devil after they are saved. You can kick them out of a church, but you cannot kick them out of Christ. Whether or not they are saved is between them and God. We cannot uh, make that determination, but... Uh, the Bible says we should treat them as if they are not part of the church when they unrepentantly live that way. We try, we try to make them to reconcile. And then we talked about not inheriting the kingdom of God. And we looked at Luke and Matthew. And not inheriting the kingdom does not mean that you don't inherit eternal life. So you do have an inheritance in heaven that's not associated with a reward. You do have a place in heaven. And when the kingdom comes, you will have a place in the kingdom. But there is a reward aspect of the inheritance as well. And you can reign over ten cities or five cities, etc. or so forth, as the examples we saw in Luke chapter 9, 19. Uh, or you can rule over nothing if you don't live for Christ. So you can lose your reward. We talked about the things you can lose. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your reward, your family, your health, your testimony, your reputation, your ministry, your longevity, your job, your mind. You can lose all sorts of things. Uh, the list is exhaustive. So the question is, do you have eternal life? Or do you have temporary life? Or do you have pending life? Are you trusting Jesus? Or are you trusting in yourself to keep you saved? So this has been Eternal Security. Feel free to watch any of our other videos. If you like this video, subscribe. Some of the other videos that we've covered, like the transitional perspectives on baptism, on Jew to Gentile, those will really help some of these explanations that were in this video stand out a little bit more, be a little bit easier to grasp because of how God deals differently with different things at different times. So it's impossible to cover every single aspect in one little short video, and yes, I consider this to be short. <laughs> but we did talk about eternal security. If you have any questions, shoot me an email at kevin at beyondthefundamentals.com. We'll try to do some more videos and answer some of those or I can respond to those emails, make a comment in, in below. And also, I have a sheet on my website that talks about uh, eternal security. Lots of reasons why eternal security, a lot of the same things here. I didn't cover that line for line, but the link will be in the description below. Go to the website. I have, a, I have two PDFs that you can open up and look at to see notes on why the believer is secure in Christ, why we can trust Christ to be kept by the power of God, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.